Hi, welcome or welcome back to my channel and welcome back to what is quickly becoming one of my favorite series on this channel, I think, where I tell you all about the books that are coming out for the next two months. In this episode, we will be talking about the books coming out in March and April. We will be covering every genre that I read, fantasy, romanticy, romance, thrillers, mysteries. I think we've got Regency romance in there, historical fiction, and even a nonfiction and a biography. Also at the end, I will be talking about which of these books will be included in some of the most popular book boxes, at least the ones that I subscribe to. And don't worry, I will be sure to warn you first and let you know when to turn me off so none of the book choices are spoiled for you. So without further ado, let's talk about the books that are getting released in March. Welcome to March. You'll be experiencing all four seasons, not just in the month, but sometimes in the same day. But we'll be seeing lots of green, and I hope you've been saving lots of green because man, they are hitting us hard <laughs> with these books. March 5th, get ready, because that is when Red Tower is giving us their next book. That's right, Bloodguard by C.C. Robson is finally coming out, and listen up if you are still feeling the romanticy feels. So this is about Leith of Grey, who is a gladiator. We're not up to a great start here, for me at least. And he volunteered, he's vicious, he's bloodthirsty, and he figures he will earn enough to save his dying sister, so like, points for nobility. <laughs> he's got nothing left to lose, right? Dying sister, no family. It turned out he was wrong. He lost his hope, his freedom, and his humanity. Yeah, no. Now all he has is his scarred body, which is fueled by rage. Why did I pre-order this book? Right, 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 here we go. And her mave, Elvin Royal, who stands for everything he despises and whom he should hate. Should, the word should is used directly until she offers him a chance to earn his freedom, but it won't be cheap. And apparently neither will his revenge. Don't hurt Maeve. Don't hurt the elven princess. On the same day, we are also getting trouble by Lex Croucher. This is the same author of the book Reputation, which I just ran and got. So if I moved slightly, I was fetching a book. I still haven't read this, but it's like Bridgerton plus Mean Girls. So believe me when I say this is so high in my million pound TBR. Anyway, this one is so really like sound of music -y. Hear me out. This is about the new government at Fairmont House, and she is trouble. She is not polite, she is not polished, and she has never taught a child in her freaking life. Her sister Amy, who is kind, is brilliant, and actually for some godforsaken reason does love children. This this is the description. I, I have a child. I, I like children. I was a teacher. Is sick. And their parents are like completely basically 100% useless. One's like totally out of the picture. The other one is like, think of drinking somewhere. Good luck, guys. So it's up to Emily to make sure that the job is taken care of and the doctor taking care of her sick sister gets paid. Hence, going off to play governess at this estate. And she figures this is fine. She'll go there for a few months. There's no way she's going to develop feelings for this family because she's new like children. Like the Edwards family, not going to be a problem. And she'll grab a few months wages, maybe grab a few trinkets to sell, hightail it out of there. Grace, she talks too much. Sure, she's like really loving, but it's fine. And Aster, she's 16. How is she gonna like a 16 year old? No one likes 16 year olds. And Captain Edwards, he's brooding and taciturn and he looks really good without a shirt. Sound of music, right? Right. Next up, we are really flipping around with these genres here. I've got a thriller for you by one of my favorite thriller writers, Simone St. James. She is putting out Murder Road, okay? And listen up because if you like thriller writers that get annoyed when they're like oh, it might be supernatural it might be supernatural no i'm just kidding i was playing you the whole time simone st james follows through this takes place back in july 1995 which i love okay i'm feeling the 90s i have been rocking chokers all year i'm just like into it okay i kind of missed out on it like growing up who's gonna be rocking a choker when you're a toddler this is about april and eddie and they are actually heading off on their honeymoon they just happen to take like a lost turn and they're wandering around on this road looking for their little b and b and they happen to see this hitchhiker so they pick her up and they're like hun you know like you shouldn't be out here by yourself the 90s they're semi-cautious not cautious enough yet and then they see blood seeping through her coat and as they're driving her to the hospital a truck starts chasing them down 
around. <laughs> Not good. Luckily, they make it to the hospital. Unluckily, Chicky Poo with the bleeding coat dies. Now, it turns out they have caught themselves in the middle of a little bit of a mystery because there's a whole serial killer running along this road and they just witness the last of his or her victims go put in the hospital. It turns out they're the only witnesses and I'm like, we'll be as helpful as we can. There was totally this truck and you didn't see it really and you're interviewing us an awful lot. They're not sure if they're like witnesses now or suspects. So they figure it's kind of up to them to get investigating and the more they investigate this like town right next to this really creepy little road, the more they're like, you know, it seems like this town, there's some dark secrets y'all should be like investigating. And yeah, this is probably where Simone St. James gets super creepy in her supernatural. Naturalness. It gives no hints as to what is <clears throat> lurking around the next bend, but I can't wait to find out. And if you subscribe to Book of the Month, I'm hoping this is going to be one of their picks. Another book that may very well show up in Book of the Month is Women of Good Fortune by Sophie Wan. Listen to this one. This one sounds so much fun. So we've got Lulu, right? She's like realistic cynic. We all know the type, right? Like not me. So when Shanghai's most eligible bachelor proposes to her, she's just like, yeah, okay. I mean, he could solve everything, including all of her parents' financial problems, except for like, she's not in love with him and she doesn't really want to marry him. So enter her two besties. We have got career-driven Rena, who's got her ear listening to her ticking biological clock, and this is especially problematic for her because she's kind of been waiting for her next promotion of work, which she completely and totally deserves, but she keeps getting passed over for it because she's not a man. Yeah. We so don't love that. Then we have got Jane. She is a luxury housewife, shall we say, and she is ready to trade up for her next model husband, but she feels like she needs some cash to do it. She needs a little like lift here and tuck there. These things cost money. So they're all like, we need money to make our dreams come true. And they all look at this wedding opportunity and they're like, hmm, you know what? We're going to plan the freaking social event of the season. We are going to plan the biggest, baddest wedding Shanghai has ever seen. And then as per tradition, everyone will bring with them these massive cash gifts. All we need to do now is expand our crew a little, make a plan, and then execute the biggest, possibly first, wedding heist that Shanghai has ever seen. Besties for life! Again, super switching gears, still on March 5th, we have got Disney's Prom Chanted coming out by Morgan Matson. I am a prom girl. No one is surprised to hear this. Yes, this is why. Yes, I am excited for it. Listen, listen, listen to this one. Okay, are you ready? This is about a poor girl named Stella, and she has been ditched by her boyfriend like three weeks before prom, and so she is convinced that she does not want anything to do with it. However, her bestie has said, look, we have been planning to go to Disneyland right before for prom for forever. You gotta at least do that with me. And Stella's like, fine. And lo and behold, she goes. But when she shows up along with her bestie is Reese. And Stella does not get along with Reese. He's cute, but she does not like Reese. Mm -hmm. We've heard this before. However, at one point during the day, they must find themselves alone because as they're wandering through Sleeping Beauty's castle, they find this random creepy door. And <laughs> what do these two teenagers do? They walk through it. They find themselves in the middle of Sleeping Beauty. Like the movie, the story, it's happening in front of them. I am so jealous. It's not even funny right now. Only they screw it all up. They mess up the meet cute between Aurora and Prince Philip. It happens way sooner than it's supposed to. The two of them do not have all lovey-dovey fuzzies. The three are super suspicious, as they should be, about them. Even Maleficent's kind of like, I heard word about you two. And it's kind of like, watching that, you don't want that. These two are meanwhile like, oh my god, we have totally effed up this story. If we don't get things back on track, we may never get home and have internet access or cell phone service ever again. How cute does that sound? I'm so excited for this book. Oh my god, I am so excited for this book. Same day, March 5th, we also have The Prisoner's Throne coming out by Holly Black. This is the second in the Stolen Air. Apparently it's a duology. So sad that it's ending for everyone. I am not an Elfheim girl. Enjoy Books to Ashes. We also have Swift and Saddled by Lila Sage coming out. This is the second book in her Rebel Blue Ranch series. I did just by the first done and dusted. I'm loving these like retro-licious covers. I'm feeling video like cowboys coming on. Like I'm just feeling the, I don't know what it is. 
Yes, I do. I blame LC Silver completely and totally. I'm excited for it, but just in case there was like continuity stuff, I didn't want to totally ruin it for myself. So all I can tell you about it is it's like that polished, hardcore, hardworking, glamorous city girl, and then like rustic cowboy romance. So yeah, Hallmark movie vibes, but I'm excited to try them out. I've heard good things. If Chandler Ainsley has good things to say, I often enjoy the books. So we also have Finley Donovan rolls the dice number four. I didn't even grab Finley Donovan. Sorry, guys. You know what it looks like. I can't believe we're on number four by El Casamano. You're killing it, girl. But at this point, if Finley Donovan started out being mistaken as an assassin at this point, she's got to have like flipped a switch and be like going after people. How else are you keeping the series going? Did she switch back to being a writer? Rolls the dice? Probably not. Good luck to Finley Donovan at some point. I really am going to read that series. I really am also coming out on that day still march 5th i know the poisons we drink by bethany baptiste and i heard very good things about this kyla from the infinite library really liked this one this is about venus and she lives in a country where it is like humans versus witchers and i think that's what they call witches there so venus is making illegal love potions to like support the fam good for you brewing them causes like really painful unfortunate debilitating side effects and then if you get caught like if you're lucky you go to jail if you're not lucky um <clears throat> her biggest problem is not even that. It's this like dark magic that's like inside of her. I'm getting like one dark window vibes of Rachel Gellig. I'm hoping that's what it's kind of like. Remember like the nightmare in the girl like talking to her and stuff. I'm kind of hoping it's like that. I have no idea. Obviously I haven't read the book. One day when her mom is killed and she is forced to like take her little sister on as her responsibility, she also gets the chance from the grand witcher. I love that. I want to be a grand witcher. To get her revenge for mommy's death because mommy's death was a murder, by the way. So, isn't that nice? And she is offered the chance to brew these super illegal, I'm guessing, and ones that don't come without consequences. I'm also guessing poisonous <laughs> potions that allow her to enslave the most powerful politicians in DC. <clears throat> So the lines of power and magic become super blurred. Wouldn't that be nice? So, March 12th, or the Tuesday before St. Patrick's Day, we'll be bringing you one of the books I am most excited for. Look at this cover. Cover. Wherever it pops up on the screen, are you seeing this cover? It is gorgeous, okay? So the Hedgewitch of Fox Hall, first of all, amazing cover. Second, listen to the little blurb. This is about a rebellious witch and her last ditch efforts to restore magic to medieval whales while two princes vie for her heart. Do you need more than that? I don't think so, but it's a standalone romanticy. Do you need more? I don't, I don't, but I will tell you more because I'm nice. Magic is fading from Wales. It is being choked off by this enemy king's massive wall that spans the entire border. And an attack is now imminent. Of course, it's the dragons are now gone. Prince Taliesin would love to just like watch the magic fade away. And Prince David fears both the magic and the throne. He sounds like a real winner. Daddy promises the crown to whichever son can destroy the wall and return the magic to Wales. And so the brothers are now in this like rivalry. I thought David was afraid of the magic and the throne, but whatever. Now Fionn, she is the last hedge witch of Fox Hall. And that means she only takes from nature what it can spare. Unlike the Fox Hall coven, who will literally take out like a freaking forest if that's what they need to accomplish their current spell. I would like to explain global warming to them. Talison goes on his quest and he goes to talk to the coven and they're like, you yeah, know, we're not helping you. And so then he goes and seeks out the last edge witch. And Fionn, like, she has this magic he hates and she's not like super thrilled with him either, but she agrees because she needs some serious power behind her to regain what the coven cost her. No, it does not say what it is. She will do whatever it takes. She has to walk the entire freaking border wall with this prince who struts along like a gosh darn peacock or strike a deal. With his surprisingly wily brother behind his back, she will. And uh, maybe you try not to lose her heart in the process. I am so excited for this book. I really, really am. Maybe I'll be reading this on St. Patrick's Day if it ships in time. Next up, we have Happily and Ever After by Lynn Painter. And here is a weird thing about Lynn Painter's books. I really tend to enjoy these as audiobooks. Don't know why, but her writing just translates so well to audio. So if you are looking for a new audiobook to try, maybe 
pick this one up. So this is about Sophie. And Sophie needs to call off her wedding after her fiance cheats on her again. Her fiance's dad is her dad's boss. Super unfortunate. And <laughs> daddy's boss, let's just say, he's a little intense would definitely hold a grudge, might absolutely 100% hurt her father's career if she hurt his son. Yeah, one of those types. We get the point. So she hires an objector. What's an objector, you ask? It's exactly what it sounds like. An objector's job is to, when the wedding officiant is like, does anyone object to this union? It is their job to stand up and say, I object and ruin the whole gosh darn wedding. Lots of drama and all that good stuff. So so she hires Max. Max does his thing. Now Sophie's feeling pretty gosh darn cynical after all of this stuff. And so she decides, you know what, I want to be an objector. And he's like, all right, you can come with me and I'll train you. And like, you can see how this works and see if you really think this is for you. Let's do it. So finally, uh, they get hired by this guy who, as it turns out, is engaged to the woman who originally broke Max's heart 11 years ago and is the reason he is now an objector. Good luck, guys! Also on the 12th, A Touch of Chaos comes out by Scarlett St. Clair. This is the fourth book in the Hades and Persephone saga. And, oh, my gosh. I read, like, A Touch of Darkness, and I liked it quite a lot. And then I picked up the first book in, like, the Hades POV, and I thought it was a different series, and I got really confused, and I was just, like, having deja vu, and it totally just threw me so much that I gave up on the series. But now I'm having, like, FOMO. Should, should I just read just from her? Because I didn't really love his POV. L let me know. Okay, anyway. After that is Such a Lovely Family. This is by Aggie Blum Thompson on a perfect day in the middle of cherry blossom season in Washington, D.C. The Calhouns are planning another picture perfect event with their perfect friends, perfect neighbors, and their three perfect adult children. I'm calling BS on all of that except for the perfect cherry blossoms. Too bad there's a murder and it becomes a homicide scene instead. Yeah, if all those people were perfect, there would not be a homicide just then. As it turns out, the parents emotionally and financially manipulate their adult children. One son is trying to outrun his problems. Problems. The other will do anything to protect his child. New daddy. Like, totally get it. And the third is an Instagram influencer in total denial about reality. I mean, her husband. Cherry blossoms and long buried resentments are now in bloom, and it is dark family secret season in Washington, D.C. Now, randomly on the 14th, because someone felt Thursday was more fun than Tuesday to put this book out this week, we've got Not Your China Doll, The Wild and Shimmering Life of Anna Mae Wong by Katie G. Salisbury. Now, unsurprisingly to anyone who knows me, my interest in fashion also extends to Hollywood, particularly old Hollywood in general. So check out this story. Anna Mae apparently rose to stardom in the jazz age in Hollywood, but she got really, really sick and tired of playing all the, like, stereotypical Asian roles, and so she headed abroad, where she not only starred in acclaimed films across Europe in multiple countries, she dazzled suitors and royalty. So when she returned to Hollywood, she exposed its racism, like, hardcore, and went on to escape the typecasting and reshape American representation in film. And what makes this book kind of special is not only is it written by an Asian American author, but she was granted access by the actual actress's family to her personal effects. So this whole thing is going to be one heck of a read if you are interested in Hollywood history. Also on March 14th, I'm tentatively saying this sounds vaguely like a Sleeping Beauty retelling for me. We have the highly anticipated What Monstrous Gods by Rosamond Hodge. Yes. Cruel Beauty, that one. In other words, do not judge me on the pronunciations of these names. I think they're Russian. So centuries ago, Reuben was this sorcerer, right? And he raised this deadly briar around either Runikia or Runikaya's palace, sending not only the entire royal family into this enchanted slumber, but silencing the kingdom's gods. That's an important part of that sentence. Now, Leah has some mysterious, miraculous magical gift, okay? And it is her destiny to kill Reuben and awaken the royals. And when she achieves this, like, seriously impressive goal, just saying, it turns out, you know, a woman's work is never done, and she still has to do more. She needs to marry 
marry into the royal family and forge a pact with a god or die. Great! <laughs> no problem. And this is all, by the way, while being haunted by the spirit of Reuben, who's really not thrilled that she, you know, killed him. So Leah and the prince that she's like betrothed to head off to waken the gods, and Reuben may actually be her only chance of survival. Like, he has magic, even though somehow he's a ghost, he's still like helpful, I guess. I don't know. It turns out things may not quite have been as she was told. Who's shocked to hear this? No one, no one. And it looks like, um, we're kind of getting a love triangle with the prince and a ghost, which I am totally down for. And we're also like seeing, um, there's a reason those gods were put to sleep permanent, like, for, like, under a curse. Gee, I wonder if maybe the old gods were not so nice and the new ones are, were maybe better and more benevolent. No, maybe, yes, just a thought. Still on March 14th, we have one of my most anticipated reads. I know I keep saying that, but like it just keeps getting better this month. A Feather So Black by Lyra Selene. I have been waiting and waiting and waiting for this book. You guys have no idea. So magic is basically lost in the mortal world, but our main girl here, Fia, she has some because she is a super rare changeling. She was left behind in exchange for the queen's daughter, basically making her like pseudo princess. Sure. And she's now stuck locked away by the fair folk. So Fia's kind of like hated for her fairy blood, but the queen sees this as an opportunity, okay? And trains her to be a spy so she can eventually rescue her real daughter. Her real daughter, Iala, is bound to the Tyrannog, so I imagine she possibly wants to come home, don't know why, except <laughs> it turns out she's thirst to become a swan all day and can only take her true like human form at night. So yeah, I might want to come home with feathers sound itchy. Anyway, of course they eventually find like a hidden gate and Fia sets off with Prince Rogan, her childhood bestie, Ail is betrothed and her current crush. This is not going to get complicated at all. Oh, no, no, no. Into the dangerous magic forest of the Fae, where nothing is as it seems and like everything probably wants to hurt you. But then it turns out Fia is also super attractive to the more monster than men, dark hearted Irian, who understands Fia in a way no one else has. I love it when they do this. Light versus dark. I just, oh, I am just so excited for this. So excited for this. This is like tailor made for me. So time is running out. We've got Secrets of the Past coming out, a love triangle. Like, just, it's the Swan Princess and a love triangle with Faye. I just, this book cannot come soon enough, okay? It just can't. And the cover is amazing. I will buy an outfit with feathers just for this book. I swear to you. I swear to you. Welcome, Spring. No, you can't quite see the glitter bunny ears, but. They're there, okay? We also have quite a few books coming out to help us welcome spring on March 19th. We have Where Sleeping Girls Lie by Frida Abike Ayimde. I'm probably not pronouncing that exactly right, but man, I listened to a bunch of people say it and I tried really hard. She wrote Ace of Spades, which is the book I'm holding up here, and this is Finally, her next novel. I've been waiting to see what she was going to do next. I am so excited because I loved this Dark Academia book. And it looks like she is going down the Dark Academia road again. Say it with me. Yay. This is about Sade. And she is the new girl at the prestigious, always prestigious, of course, Alfred Nobel Academy boarding school. She's not feeling super optimistic. She's a junior and she's been homeschooled her whole life up until now. Hello, Katie Heron. And apparently Miss Fortune just like kind of tends to follow her. I don't know what this means, but okay. Apparently she's not kidding because on her very first night, her roommate goes missing. That's unfortunate. All right. And people kind of think she has something to do with it. This, however, <laughs> some reason, catches the eyes of the most popular girls known as the Unholy Trinity. We're seeing the Mean Girls references, right? Between finding out more about them, catching up with her schoolwork, and trying to find out what happened to her missing roommate, Sayed really, really, really has her hands full. Oh, and then another student is murdered. And she realizes that like the Academy has some secrets that rival her own. This is going to be good. It's gonna be surprising. It's gonna get dark. There's gonna be some sort of social and or racial commentary. I am so excited for this. 
Next, we have another book that I'm hoping will come out in book of the month, and that is Expiration Dates. This is by Rebecca Searle, and they did do her last book, One Italian Summer, in their box. This sounds really, really unique and good to me. So this is about Daphne, and every time she meets a new guy, she gets a slip of paper, like, with his name on it and a number, and that is, like, their expiration date. It might be, like, three weeks, it might be three months, but she gets a number, and that's when she knows, okay, that's when we're gonna break up, time's gonna be up. I mean, this sounds awful and fatalistic and I'd be so depressed, but this has been going on for 20 years and apparently she's been like getting along fine with it. I mean, what are you gonna do? Not date. At this time, she's doing okay. She's living with her ex-boyfriend now turned bestie. They're hanging out and one night she goes out on this blind date and she gets a slip of paper with the name Jake on it and that's it. No numbers. Could he be? <gasps> the one. Now it sounds all great and wonderful until she like really starts to get to know him and they start dating and like he is great and wonderful and perfect and fine and everything like he hasn't done anything wrong but she very quickly realizes that like there are some things about her that if he knew them they would break his freaking heart and I am very curious to know what these things are but whatever it is she knows that if she's totally honest with this guy they can't possibly be like true soulmates and this is all about like honesty finding your soulmate fate and you know what my money's on the ex-boyfriend current bestie with whom she is currently living we also have oh man check out this cover this is another great one the love remedy by elizabeth everett and i'm not gonna lie to you okay this is on my list because of two reasons. A, Bridgerton's coming out soon, so you say like Victorian age and anything remotely near the Regency era, and I'm like ready to jump. And number two, look at the cover. I'm like in such a cover by mood right now. It is not great. Or maybe it's just the covers are just incredible. Like we are in an era of gorgeous books, and I feel so spoiled and so lucky and just so happy. Anyway, this is about Lucinda, and she is a Victorian apothecary who has just perfected the formula for herself that cures croup. And, like, have you ever had the croup cough? Like, it is horrible, okay? Good for you, Lucinda, that actually used to, like, take out kids in that era. So, good for you. However, people are stupid and selfish, and someone steals her cure, and she's like, okay. <laughs> This keeps happening. This is clearly the work of a rival apothecary because this is the latest in a very long string of misfortunes and like little thefts. And this is a big theft if you ask me. What's a girl to do? Well, apparently a girl is to hire P.I. Jonathan Thorne. I feel like we've heard this name before, have we? I don't know. It's a great name. It's the perfect name, in fact, if you ask me, for a grumpy single father in the Victorian era who you know is going to be her romantic interest. Now, now, it turns out there are actually like plenty of suspects. Like it's a long list if you read the description, okay? And thus, this means there is plenty of time for Lucy to chip away at that armor he's got on, you know? Mm. And uh, based on the title, The Love Remedy, I'm guessing that they're gonna be finding a very specific cure to all of their woes, professional and personal. Next up, I want to talk about The Morning Side by Taya Obrett, and this is a very, like, random pick that I found. I think it might be a little too out there for Book of the Month, but this might be a good selection for Aardvark Book Club, which I am, like, I'm eyeing. I see you, Aardvark. I'm thinking about you, Aardvark. I really like the bookmarks. I don't know. Do we need another book subscription? I just subscribed to two more special edition ones. Oh my god. God, I have such a, it's not a problem if you don't want to solve it. Okay, so the morning side is about Sylvia and her mom has just become the superintendent of this like crumbling luxury tower hotel after leaving their ancestral home. And we are not told why. <laughs> Sylvia does not know why. No one's telling anyone why, okay? From what I read somewhere, we sort of have like a sinking city thing going on. And we just had this in Fathom Folk too. Do these authors know something that we don't? A woman who lives there named Anna decides, you know what, I'm going to tell poor Sylvia, at the very least, some folklore about her demolished homeland. I guess that one already sang completely. It was so beautiful and lovely and possibly, shall we even say, mm, what's the word I'm looking for, enchanting. So Sylvia becomes kind of obsessed with this land and eventually becomes obsessed with this mysterious enigma of a woman who's living in the penthouse, Bessie Duras which I'm probably saying completely wrong. This woman has a private elevator and leaves the penthouse only at night with her three massive hounds. And most nights she does not return until right before dawn. 
This book is described as being about the stories we tell and the ones that we refuse to tell, as a means of making sense of where we come from and who we hope to become. I think that sounds so profound, so beautiful. I have the feeling if the description is giving me like a little shiver at the end, I think this is going to be one of those books that just blows me away. At least I'm hoping it is. I have the feeling this is going to be one of the ones that I read and just like I'm in awe of and it sticks with me for a long time. At least that's what I'm hoping. So really looking forward to the morning side. I feel like I've been reading so much fluff lately that my brain has slightly turned to mush and I'm looking forward to things that are going to make me think a little bit more, if you know what I mean. On the other hand, I'm also really looking forward to Peril in Pink, Don't Say One Word by Sydney Lee, which is described as Shit's Creek meets only murders in the building. So we have got Jess, and on the night of her grand opening of her brand new B&B, &B, The Pearl, I love that name for a b and in the Hudson Valley, she is super psyched and super betty. This B&B &B is like the ultimate insta-worthy B&B, okay? And her opening is going to be like perfection. She has every detail planned right down to her ex, who I'm very sorry to inform you is named Lars, performing there. And he has this like reality singing sensation, okay? He is creating some buzz. Unfortunately, when Lars's manager and stepdad turns up dead, Lars is sort of looking like suspect number one. And this is occurring just as the guests are checking in and the welcome mimosas are being poured. That is some bad timing. Yikes. Now, Jess knows she needs, like, in order to save her opening and, all right, to save Lars, she's gonna probably have to do some really fast investigating herself, only then he's found at the scene of another murder. The guests are now in lockdown. It turns out that there definitely is such a thing as bad press, at least for a B&B. &B. You know, there's a killer on the loose. People don't love that. And since this is a book, I mean, they don't know that, but we do, we know. The police are useless and it's up to her and her bestie cat to catch the killer and save the day. Will it be Lars? I don't know, but I hate his name. I bet the author knows it's a terrible name, so I'm saying yes, it's a possibility. Finally, the last on this day is The Veiled Kingdom by Holly Renee. Yes, the author of the Stars and Shadows series, and no, I did not love the first book in that series, and I'm not planning on continuing on because I felt like the author just wanted to write the smut and then like ran through the rest of the scenes in that book like really quickly to get to the dirty stuff, but I feel like, you know what, she's written an entire series. A lot of people ended up enjoying it, so I'm going to give her second series a try and see if she has grown as an author because okay it also sounds very like this is romanticy period end of sentence but they like romanticy so this is about missing daughter of the despised king who accidentally finds herself amongst the rebels fighting against said despised king and princess here of course of course finds herself in an enemy's lover's tale with the son of the rebellion commander. You know the smut at least is gonna be good, so it's worth trying out the first in the new series. Maybe it'll blow me away. There'll probably be some kind of blowing. Blowing kisses is what I meant, of course. On March 26th, the author of We Are Never Ever Getting Back Together, which I completely and totally loved last year and was YA, so get your minds out of the gutter, Sophie Gonzalez, is bringing us The Perfect Guy Doesn't Exist, which I beg to defer. I married him. He's taken. Sorry. This one is about Ivy, and when her parents head out of town for a weekend away, Ivy will play. Sort of. She invites her bestie, Henry, over, and they are going to just binge their new favorite fantasy show. Okay. When he is not there or he's asleep, I don't know, she is going to write more fan fiction about it. Girl knows how to live it up. She also is going to spend her time making sure that she avoids her neighbor, Mac, who was her bestie and is now her enemy. But he is good looking, so at least there's eye candy in the neighborhood, I suppose. I'm not suspecting any kind of anything there at all. No. Mm -mm. So it turns out that her perfect weekend might be even more perfect when she wakes up on the first morning and it seems that her fanfic has brought the main character of her show to life just as she imagined him. But then Weston starts causing like a lot of trouble. He's a man. What did you expect? Even if you wrote him, like, sorry. And it apparently some tropes are definitely better on screen than off. Mm, uh, all right. Good luck writing that one. So she teams up with Henry and Mac, the bestie and the really attractive neighbor who she swears she's now enemies with, to figure out what to do, why he's there, and if he's really the perfect guy for her after all. 
I can answer that now and I haven't read the book and yet I'm dying to read the books because it sounds like so much fun, so. We also have The Good, The Bad, and The Aunties by Jesse Q. Sutanto. This is number three in the Dial A for Aunties series. I'm holding the book. I own the book. I own the second book. Have I read any of them? No, I'm a terrible booktuber. We also have A Governess's Guide to Passion and Peril by Amanda Collins. This is number four in The Ladies Most Scandalous. Uh, this starts out with The Ladies Guide to Mischief and Mayhem, which I will pop up here. I absolutely own this book. I absolutely can't find this book, which means it's in the very, very, very scary pile of books I'm supposed to be doing a book haul on that are not special editions that I have not done since October and now have hit the triple digits and I'm going to just have to give up and start over because no one wants to watch that then I sure don't want to film it. That is it for March. Now it's time for April. Welcome to April. Now they might be talking about showers bringing flowers, but quite frankly, I'm still just talking about books. So let's get into it because there are still a ton of them. And once again, Red Tower is starting us off. I think they've got a plan, guys, and it is book world domination. This one is the last one by Rachel Housel Hall. This is apparently described as The Witcher means N.K. Jemison, and that means nothing to me. This is about Kai, and Kai unfortunately has no memories of anything before waking up naked and voiceless in a forest outside this like little town where everyone is either afraid of her or hates her. Kai is having a really, really bad day. Now, monsters keep coming after her and fighting them continually means unlocking a new power every time she does. So this is kind of cool. Like, I forget the examples that were given, but I think one time she like fought one off and then she could like stop time for a sec. Another time she fought one off and she could like portal herself a teeny tiny bit. Unfortunately, she also has a major weakness, which is like <laughs> touch a regular human and part of her dies. I don't know exactly what that means internally and externally, but it doesn't sound great and I hope it's not gonna be gory, Rachel Hazel Hall. Thank you. Somehow Kai does know that like the source of her power, which is like this amulet thing, uh, has been stolen from her by a chick that she thought was her friend, but like friends don't do that to friends. So uh -uh -uh. she's working with her brother, he's like the town blacksmith sounds yummy, to get it back. And then Elin shows up, this other random like gray haired woman, and like she claims to be this old friend, but she's stronger than Kai. She's lying all over the place and keeps trying to like stop Kai from doing anything but like help her advance, get her amulet back, figure things out. So that's kind of sus. Like why? And like <laughs> Kai's like, I really need to know who I am. The next book I want to talk about, I'm so excited about because I am a Holly Jackson stan. And no, I didn't read Five Survive. Like, I heard so many things that were, like, not great about it. But in the reappearance of Rachel Price, it sounds like Holly Jackson is going back to her true crime roots, which has got me practically squealing with joy and anticipation. We have 18-year-old Belle, whose mom disappeared when she was only two. So poor Belle was, like, the only witness, but she remembers nothing. I don't remember anything from when I was two either. Don't feel bad, Belle, but of course, Belle feels bad. Rachel is presumed dead, and Belle just kind of like wants to be done with the whole thing, and I can't blame her. Like, you're 18, you want to move on, this has been like a horrible tragedy in your life, you're a grown-up now. I totally get it. Go to college. Live your life. But her family has finally agreed to like film this true crime documentary on the whole thing, and that is when Rachel Price reappears, and she's alive. Rachel has this truly like unbelievable, truly unbelievable story to tell. And, um, well, you know what? Belle isn't sure she buys it. So when the cameras, like, stop rolling, Belle starts an investigation of her own. Pip vibes! If you haven't read The Girl's Guide to Murder, turn me off. Go read it. So in this investigation, Belle wants to find, like, where the heck her mom has really been hiding all these years, and, like, could she be dangerous? Yeah, that feels important to know. In the romance world, some of the most anticipated books of the year are coming out in April. I don't know why they just are. And one of them is Just for Summer by the beloved Abby Jimenez. I can finally say I read a book by her, although not her most famous. It's about Justin, who has like a curse on him. Like he's convinced like it might be like the real legitimate deal to the point where he posts about it on Reddit. That's a choice. And the whole internet now knows about it. What did you think was going to happen, Justin? You posted on Reddit. Anyway. Every woman who dates him, immediately upon breaking up with him, 
finds their soulmate. Like, I would want to date Justin if I was single. Emma then slides into his DMs and is like, this is so weird, but I have the same curse. Every guy I date who breaks up with me then immediately finds their soulmate gets married, that's it, the end, you get the picture. And he's like, huh. So they hatched this perfect plan to date one another, figuring that like then their curses will cancel one another out and when they break up, they will immediately find their soulmates. This kind of makes sense in a weird way to me. Either that or their soulmates, which like did not occur to them, but it's occurred to me and probably all of you at this point. But we're gonna let that go and let the book play out and I will give you the rest of the plot anyway, because there is more. And it has a job as this traveling nurse and she gets a job for three months like where she has to go out and rent a cabin and they decide okay you know what it's summer we're gonna rent this cute cabin we're gonna live together it's gonna like ramp up our relationship but sure why not well Emma's crazy mother shows up that complicates things further and then all of a sudden poor Justin he ends up for some reason I'm sure it's not a fun one ends up with custody of his three siblings for the summer too. Good times guys. Um, you have fun with that in your little lake house cabin. I hope it has a lot of space and uh, have fun catching those feelings for one another. I look forward to watching. Next up we have an interesting debut novel. This is called The Husbands and Novel by Holly Gramazio. So this is about Lauren. One night Lauren returns home to her London flat. She's tired. She's excited to be home. She's greeted by her husband. Only she's not married. But her phone, her friend, and her much improved decor in her flat totally disagree with her. When said husband goes up into the attic to like change a light bulb, a new husband comes down in his place and then her life kind of changes around her just, just a bit. And apparently Lauren's attic now has this seemingly never ending supply of new husbands. So now Lauren has to figure out when do you know when you found the right life? I think this sounds kind of interesting. I think it's a slightly different take than I've seen on this kind of trope before. And I'm very intrigued to check it out. Also, after I read this book, I probably, you know, won't be allowing my husband to go in the attic. You know what? I'm not letting him go in the attic starting now. Approximately 10 hours later, We're also getting the next book from Sanguimandano, who are the very secret society of irregular witches. Did anyone else feel like that love scene just like came out of nowhere? Like you, you didn't have to do it like in the car in the woods. You could, you could, you could have waited. Like could have been better. No, just me. Anyway, so at first I was like, why are you publishing a witch's kind of magical in keeping in spring? Like save it for Halloween. But then I realized, you know what? It's kind of totally genius because. First of all, I love the cherry blossoms on the cover. It's a gorgeous cover. Second of all, you now have a witch book out when no one else does. Everyone's gonna be putting their witchy books out in Halloween. This is about Sarah Swan, who was once one of the most powerful witches in Britain. Good for you, Sarah Swan. At least until she brought back her great aunt Jasmine from the very, very recently dead, lost most of her magic and befriended a semi-villainous talking fox. That is a direct quote. I would also befriend the semi-villainous talking fox in a heartbeat, no questions asked. So do not blame her there. And was exiled from the magical guild. She now, you guessed it from the title, helps her Aunt Jasmine run an inn in Lancashire. That actually sounds like a lovely life. I have no complaints so far, but apparently she does because one day she hears about this old spell book that may be the key to restoring her powers. And so she teams up with the gorgeous, but I see historian, Luke Larson, who may of course be the only person in the whole wide world who can unlock the book's mysteries. I know. Oh, also, um, so this is completely and totally irrelevant, but he's also a previous one night stand. I don't even, I'm not even sure why I'm bringing it up. It just, it happens to be in the description. We also have the last book coming out on this day. I know we're still on April 2nd. It's the longest day in the world. We have from PC Cast and Kristen Cast. That's right. The authors of the House of Night series, which no, I admittedly did not love, but holds a lot of nostalgia for a lot of people. So I wanted to mention it. We have a new series starting called Draw Down the Moon. This cover is stunning. Okay, the cover art, amazing. I cannot complain for one second about that. But this is a YA duology set in a dark magical world. And well, I don't know if I necessarily will be picking it up, especially because I don't love the title, which is borrowed from a nonfiction book that is basically a seminal neo-pagan classic exploring the religion. If you are feeling the nostalgia, I think this is going to deliver exactly what you want. We've got a girl who previously was 
totally normal, but shows her powers on her 18th birthday and is whisked off to the Academia de la Luda. And there she meets Ren, who basically has had a crush on her her whole entire life. But, you know, everyone thought she was a mundane. And meanwhile, he comes from this like super powerful, super rich, super influential family in the magical world, blah, blah, blah. And this is one of those schools where there's like trials and that kind of thing. So we are hitting trope after trope after trope here. But this year, something is different. Of course, it seems super dangerous and different. And then of course there are prophecies and murder. So if you are feeling nostalgia and you've enjoyed PC cast and Kristen cast in the past, this one might be for you. And I love that they're a mother daughter writing duo. I really do. So April 9th, we are super switching gears. I have been craving nonfiction lately. This is the start of the year. I've just like had a nonfiction book going. I think my brain is like, please feed me. I need learning. So I am super interested in picking up The Age of Magical Overthinking Notes on Modern Irrationality by Amanda Montel. I'll give you a second to get past that. So this explores our cognitive biases and the power disadvantages and highlights of magical thinking. Now, I also was like, are you going to define magical thinking? And thankfully she did. So basically magical thinking is like the belief that your internal thoughts can affect like unrelated events in the external world. Think of it like the conviction that you can like manifest your goals or like if you send out good vibes in the world, that'll like help you like, I don't know, win a lottery or lose weight or whatever your goal is or your own good behavior can affect something totally unrelated. Like if you're really, really, like when you're a kid and you're like, oh my gosh, if I like I clean my room every day this week and do all my chores, like I'll get it and that test that I totally forgot to study for. Stuff like that, you know? Basically we use it to restore agency in a world of chaos. <laughs> And I think Amanda Montel in the book is sort of saying like, our brains have kind of turned this kind of thing after they've been really super overloaded in the age of information. And we've also allowed this to happen through a lot of like cognitive biases, like the halo effect. And oh man, the one I'm like super guilty of, the sunk cost fallacy. You can explain it to me however many times you want. I'm gonna fall for it. It's gonna work in me every single time. I'm sorry, it's just true. So. <laughs> I probably really need to read this book. Amanda Montel, she's the one who wrote like, I think Word Slut. I'm pretty sure that was her. And she wrote uh, Cultish, which um, I have both those books and I really, they're coming up on my TBR super soon. So I'm really excited to read this one. She just covers such interesting nonfiction topics and <laughs> ones that aren't political, uh, which is all I've been reading lately. And wow, I need a break, 2024. You are gonna be the year that breaks me aren't you? Next up we have The Familiar by Lee Bardugo, which takes place in the period of history that scares me quite possibly the most, the Spanish Inquisition. What a choice, Lee Bardugo. So when Kitchen Scullery made Lucia is discovered to have magic, her mistress forces her to improve the family's social position, and I don't think she means Lucia's because that's not how this works, by entertaining bored nobility. And hey, it's the Spanish Golden Age. You're not gonna say no to your mistress. But at this time in history, like the current king is super desperate for like even one advantage in the war against England's heretic queen, especially since he just had like an embarrassing recent armada defeat. Boy, men just really hate losing to women, don't they? So when his disgraced secretary spots Lucia, he sees a chance to regain the king's favor. And Lucia thinks this is her chance to, like, to better her own fortunes. Like, at least she's not like, like a performing monkey in heels. Maybe she has a chance to actually do something with her life, right? Right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Sure. Putting yourself uh, in the king's spotlight is always a good idea, Lucia. Yeah. Okay. Anyway. Once she gets to the court, she realizes that science, magic, and fraud all just kind of like mingle and mix and are really hard to distinguish uh, at the court. And they all, kinda, all just kind of blend together. And um, the higher she rises, the more careful she has to be because up until now, the book never told us. She's got Jewish blood running through her veins and this is the middle of the frickin' Inquisition. So that was a choice going to court. Lucia, um, but maybe with the help of mortal familiar Julian, she'll pull it off, <laughs> even if he has his own dangerous secrets. Wow, I, <laughs> I'm waiting for reviews on this one 
because I just know I'm going to be on pins and needles terrified this entire time. I read a book, uh, I think it was by Philip O'Gregory, that took place during the Spanish Inquisition when I was far too young to read it, and I've been terrified of books that take place during the Spanish Inquisition ever since, so yay. Next up, we have a book that I'm not terrified to read. It is Wild Love by Elsie Silver. This is the first book in the Rose Hill series, and man, she went hard for us in this one. I am so excited. Now I can safely finish her previous series, the one, the Powerless, Loveless, whatever that one was called, My Safety Net has arrived. So this is about Ford. He has just won World's Hottest Billionaire, according to Forbes magazine. While opening his new studio, I'm pretty sure it's a music studio, he also finds out that he's a dad. Enter single dad trope here. I think his kid's like 12 or something. Let me tell you, he's pretty grumpy because he is already in love, as in this is a He Falls First book, with Rosie. Rosie is his best friend's little sister. That's right, we've got a brother's best friend trope if we flip that around for our girl. Here. Apparently this book is filled with sparring and heat, which is basically fake enemies to lovers waiting to explode, and they will be spending lots of time in close proximity because basically the plot is Rosie comes back to town, she goes to this music studio and is like, hi, hi brother's best friend, I need a job, can I be your assistant? Oh thank you so much, I'm going to be here with you every day, we're going to spar back and forth, I have no idea you're in love with me, good, 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 he just couldn't say no to her, of course, which also means we get, he's her boss, she's the assistant trope, did you miss a single one, Elsie Silver? I don't think you did, I can't wait. Next up, we are so all over the place with this list. I've got something for everyone here. We are headed back to Thrillerville with Megan Miranda, always four stars, always, who is bringing us daughter of mine. Hazel, the daughter in question, is the daughter of Mirror Lake's longtime local detective, and she returns to town when she unexpectedly inherits her childhood home. I'm guessing you can assume that mommy is not around at this point. It's been 10 years, and she's still kind of like wearing the town, wearing the town's people, super reluctant, and man, she's kind of psychic because the town's like in the middle of this drought, right, and it's been dragging on, and the lake level's sinking and sinking, and boy, things are getting revealed, long, simmering secrets secrets are emerging, including evidence that may finally explain her mother's disappearance. Sounds like fun for Hazel. <laughs> On April 11th, I am so flipping excited. The Fox Glove King was a total five star for me, and Hannah Witten is finally giving us the sequel, The Hemlock Queen. <laughs> this is one of your favorite romances last year. If you have not read it, you are missing out. I am telling you right now. This was delightful, although I think it leaned more towards just flat out fantasy than it did romancy. I was kind of surprised. It is grim. There's death magic. So letting you know that, but if I can handle it, I promise. So can you. But I am very much looking forward to the sequel, and I look forward to waiting months and months and months and months to hopefully order one from Fairy Loot whenever they allow me to do that. Did I already order one? God, I don't even know anymore. April 16th. We've got the first in a new series from Molly X. Chang. This is To Gaze Upon Wicked Gods, and this sounds really interesting. So this is about Ruying, who was born blessed by death, and she has this really wild power. Like, listen to this. She can pull life from mortal bodies, which, like, I mean, she's basically a freaking grim reaper. Okay, I guess it's not that exciting. But she lives in a world that has been conquered by these invaders, and they completely decimated and defeated her world with this wild technology. The whole world had never seen anything like it before. And I am super curious to see if this is like a magical world that just had no technology and completely relied on magic. So it's like our technology, or if this is super advanced technology, unlike anything we've ever seen. And this is sort of fantasy being mixed with science fiction, which I've never really read the science fiction, I mean, or the combo. So super intrigued to see where that's going to go. Obviously, these invaders are super freaking hated, right? But when an enemy prince discovers her power, he offers her this deal. If she becomes his private assassin and kills off all of his political rivals, which he totally swears, like it's for the greater good, it's for the good of the invaders, sure, but it's also for good, like her family, her friends, everybody, like these are bad people, just point blank 
period. He will protect her family and make sure they never go hungry or hurt ever again. This is like not something she can guarantee without him. Unfortunately, what he didn't really know, or maybe he even did, using her powers kind of really freaking terrifies her, which I, yeah, no, that doesn't, they don't sound like much fun. And they also take time off her own life. So like she keeps doing this, she's gonna literally lose years from her own lifespan. Plus, Rini's not sure she can trust this prince, even if he does, and I quote, make her heart ache and beat faster. But she's also not sure if she's betraying her own people or not, so that part, less sweet. April 23rd, another super, super anticipated romance. I can safely say this is one of the most anticipated of the year is Funny Story by Emily Henry. Yes, I pre-ordered a signed special edition. I can't freaking wait. And this one sounds so good. So this one is about Daphne. And Daphne has always loved the way her fiance told their love story. They had a meet cute on a blustery day and they fell in love over an errant hat hopefully not on the same day because that's awfully fast and then they move back to his hometown to begin their lives together that's when the story starts sucking because that's also when her fiance realizes that he's still in love with his ex petra so this is where daphne starts a new story her own story she becomes a <laughs> children's librarian which is okay but it has a really low starting salary and so she becomes roommates with the only other person on the planet who could possibly understand her predicament which would be Petra's ex, Miles. Now, Daphne is like practical and like really kind of like buttoned up. Her coworkers are actually like wondering if possibly she's like FBI or in witness freaking protection. She's that like not sharing anything with anyone and hard to know. Uh, but Miles is like scruffy and chaotic and has a tendency to take solace and break up ballads. I would be Miles, okay? After avoiding each other at first, they kind of become friends and hatch this plan. Like, if they're going to be living together, they might as well start having fun together and go on some summer adventures. And if they're going to go on some summer adventures, they might as well take some photos. And these photos might, you know, look a certain way. And so they might as well post some of these deliberately misleading photos on all of their social platforms for their exes to see. Because why not? <laughs> but we're totally completely faking it. Of course, right? Apparently we're going to be playing fiance swap in this book and like, I am so totally here for it. Go Emily Henry. If anyone can pull this off realistically, it is 100% this author. Next up, another cover that has me swooning, which completely suits the book because it is described as a dreamy gothic romance. We have Song of the Six Realms by Judy Island, who wrote the Magic Steeped in Poison series, which I just adore. Adored, actually, I've only read the first book. I'll be reading the second book real soon. I suck at this. We have, I think it's pronounced Zoo, which is unfortunate, but whatever, who was orphaned at a young age. So her uncle sort of stepped up, like, good for you, uncle. And he arranged for her to have this apprenticeship at one of the most esteemed entertainment houses in the kingdom. Good job, uncle. Unfortunately, her uncle then gets killed. So, oh well. And then she finds herself facing this lifetime of servitude, playing the queen for snooty nobles until one night enigmatic Duke Meng requests a private performance from her. Now, I was all like sketched out at first, but like you can tell. She does, however, have to raise her eyebrow a little when this like slightly awkward and young Duke tells her if she returns to his manor for one year as his musician in residence, he will then grant her her freedom. I would have been a little suspicious. And Zeus certainly is when they barely survive an attack by a monster like straight out of a nightmare on their way back to his estate. Yeah, she was right to be because that's where she learns he is the Duke of Dreams and apparently one of the divine rulers of the celestial realm. Personally, I think this sounds awesome, but like, you know, with great power comes great danger, apparently. So downside. The six realms are on the brink of disaster and monster attacks are becoming ever more increasingly frequent. Oh, did I mention that Zoo is now the target of all of them and also <laughs> some of the other divine rulers possibly of the six realms? Because somewhere in the uh, locked memories of her past could be the answers to stopping the uh, impending war in the celestial realm. No pressure, Zoo. Try hypnotherapy. I've heard that's really effective. <clears throat> Next up, we've got Darling Girls by Sally Hepworth. Sally Hepworth is usually a hit for me when it comes to thrillers, but this one sounds 
a little terrifying. Okay, so this one's about Jessica, Nora, and Alicia. And these girls, well, life started a little rough for them. So they were all rescued from family tragedies a rough part and they all grew up together yay and now here's more unyay parts they were raised together by a loving foster mom miss fairchild on this idyllic farm you hear the hesitation in my voice correct so looks can be deceiving miss fairchild had rules could be unpredictable and was never to be crossed and so in a moment of desperation they broke away and they they thought they were free even if miss fairchild haunted their thoughts i'm not getting good vibes about miss fairchild or this idyllic farm and then one day a body is found in that idyllic home and suddenly the spotlight is shining on these three foster sisters and they aren't so sure if they are witnesses or suspects cut them a break okay the past matters uh, next up is a book I didn't think I was going to be reading and I also thought it came out last summer, so I'm just in general, like, confused. <laughs> This is not a new emotion for me, so it's fine. This is A Game of Lies by Claire McIntosh. This is apparently the second book in the DC Morgan series. The Last Party was the first. I don't know if Book of the Month is going to follow up with it, but I really did enjoy the first book. And at first I was like, I'm not going to follow on. I don't want to just follow the detective and do a detective series. I like the characters in the book. She's just a detective. But you know what? The premise is kind of amazing. So hear me out. We have... Seven reality show contestants, fam. You know I'm reading this book. And they are stranded in the Welsh mountains. Now, each one has a secret, okay? And if another contestant guesses their secret, they're eliminated. Plus, the whole world knows you're like super closely guarded, dark secret. Why are you entering this show? It must be an amazing prize because like it was revealed on live television for everyone. Yikes. Now, Detective Fionn Morgan has been watching this show, but when a contestant goes missing, like, she's no longer just a casual viewer. It's time to find out, like, who these people are, and she already knows just from watching the show that she can't trust a single one of them. That's probably true for all suspects anyway. And then, when a murder strikes, every single suspect has an alibi. That's right, all of them have alibis. After all, they all have a secret worth killing for. What is the prize for this show? To rule a freaking country? Like, you get your own island? I don't know. They say the camera never lies. I wouldn't stress anything you see on this show. I think this sounds so good. And I did like the writing in the first book, so. And then, yes, I'm going to be ordering the special edition from Fairy Loot because... I literally cannot help myself. And it's also the first in a series and a debut. Debuts always have me extra intrigued and wanting to support a new author. We have A Letter to the Luminous Deep, which is just a gorgeous title, <laughs> by Sylvie Cattrall. And I know this book in and of itself has quite the description. It is being toted as a whimsical epistolary fantasy set in a mystical underwater world with mystery and heartwarming romance. Supposedly, if you really like TJ Klune, you're going to like this book, and that's so I have high hopes. So a beautiful discovery outside of her underwater home, yeah that's right, we're going there, prompts the reclusive E, just E period, the letter and a period, to begin a correspondence with this renowned scholar named Henry Sell. And their letters are brimming with mutual passion, first for their shared interests and then eventually for one another. And together they uncover this mystery from like the deep dark depths of the ocean that would transform the underwater world. And it's no coincidence that shortly afterwards, a sea quake then destroys E's underwater home and she and Henry just like totally up and vanish. Then apparently we have a little bit of a time jump and we go to one year later when their siblings, E's sister Sophie and Henry's brother Varen, are trying to piece together the mystery of their siblings' disappearances. And they're using like the letters, the sketches, the field notes, anything and everything they can find that happened to be left behind. And they eventually uncover through all of this, like the shared love between their siblings. They had no idea that E and Henry were in love apparently. And eventually they find the key to their disappearance and what it could mean for life as they know it. I'm really hoping that they find like E and Henry and they're like, down underwater somewhere yourself and everything and like it's all gonna be okay but I don't know if this is gonna break my heart or 
what's gonna go down but i'm super intrigued the cover is beautiful that i definitely want to check out the luminous deep and finally, on April 30th, we have King of Sloth by Anna Huang. This is, I think, the fourth in her Kings of Sin series, and I am not reading this, but every time one comes out, I get more and more tempted. The covers are so pretty, and then I was looking at this one, and I'm like, wait a minute, King of Sloth? I'm gonna be real with you guys here. I'm not gonna be with a pillow prince. Just putting it out there right now. So I don't know how sexy I find the King of Sloth, but in general, I might check out the series. Now, if you are uninterested in hearing about the book box spoilers, which editions are going to be popping up in our subscription boxes for March and April, this is where you need to turn me off because I am about to be sharing all of the details with everyone else. So saying thank you so much for joining me. Please like and subscribe and let me know which books you are looking forward to the most. Now for the rest of you, listen up. For March, we have A Feather So Black. Yes, I was so hoping someone would pick this up. I called this back when I did my January, February books. So this would be a great one for someone to pick up for a box. And Fairy Loot heard me and listened. This is going to be in their adult box for March. I am so excited. Meanwhile, Fabled Book Box, of all people, picked up The Poisons We Drink by Bethany Baptiste. Like, what? Good for them. And this edition is going to be glow in the dark. Okay. And then the rest of the boxes are all like playing catch up from the previous month. Apparently they thought February was better than March. Strongly disagree. But here is what's up. Fairy Loot YA went with the Tempest of Tea, but you know what? Not complaining. 100% not complaining. Illumicrate is doing Fathom Folk. Kind of also not complaining. And Bookish Box went all the way back to January and was like, you know what? We're going to do Sanctuary of the Shadows. Okay, and their darkest box is all over the place. I'm not even touching their choices. They are just, we want you and smut and this and that. And okay, I can't even begin to follow the roadmap for their decisions there. Okay, April is a very interesting month. This is the introduction of Fairy Loot's Romanticy box. And I have been dying to see what their choices were for this one. And boy, was it an interesting one. So their adult choice. <laughs> They're pulling from May. We can't stick to a month here. No, they went with, <laughs> with evocation. Okay, S.T. Gibson. I stand S.T. Gibson, but we're just, we're just jumping on ahead. And rumor has it, Bookish Box is making that one of their monthly picks too. And I'm betting that's going to be their May pick for adults. So, okay. Y.A. We are getting darker by four. It was nowhere near on my radar until I saw it was going to be a pick for fairy loot. It is by June L.C. Tan, the author of Jade Fire Gold, which I heard a lot of good things about, but also kind of sounded like it might be a little intense for me. We'll see. This is described as Shadow Hunters meets the Chinese underworld, and I'm kind of intrigued. The romanticy choice was also chosen by Bookish Box. Lore of the Wilds, completely not on my radar and totally not a new book coming out at all, which we were told was something that Fairy Loot was going to be doing much like Bookish Box does. This better be amazing. It came out recently though, February, I think. So not been out that long and it sounds amazing. I don't really have a lot of complaints when it comes to this. I really, really don't. So this is a romantic debut, which I always love to see, and we've got an enchanted library. So already super excited. We've got two fae and a human. I am so down for this. It's not even funny. So here's the deal. We have Lore. She's 21 years old and she lives in this land that is ruled by the ruthless Fae. And she is trapped in this like forested prison and like you cannot escape, okay? She's got the scars to freaking prove it. But when her village is like totally threatened, she makes a deal with this Fae Lord. She will leave her home to categorize and organize an enchanted library. What a freaking sacrifice, right? that hasn't been touched in a thousand years. The cat chairs here, no fame may enter the library. So they need help, but there is a chance that a human may be able to breach the cursed doors. So she convinces him she's willing to risk her life for wealth, but really she's after like the one thing that the fae covet above all, magic of her own. Get it girl. So as Laura like navigates this hostile like, world outside her prison, she's forced to rely on two very different females to survive. 
I love this trope. I love this trope. Please, one light, one dark, please. They're very dangerous. They're very attractive. And they have undeniable chemistry that just ignites. And unfortunately now, she's not just in danger of losing her life, but losing her heart to the very creatures she can never trust. Yeah, I see why both boxes chose this book. I absolutely do, okay? And technically this book isn't even out yet. It comes out on February 27th. So, little bummed, I have to wait until April to get this one. And from Bookish Box, I'll see it in August? August? Maybe just... we're, we're gonna go with August. We're gonna be optimistic. So, birthday month, yay. We're gonna go with that. But, yeah. <laughs> And then good old Illumicrate did choose something from April. They went with Molly Chang's to gaze upon wicked gods, which is going to be great. And Darkly, Darkly Box, they're also like under a bookish box. They went with Wild Love by L.C. Silver. What? Okay. That's gonna be a pretty cover. That is everything for me. Thank you so much for joining me. I hope you heard all about so many books that you are interested in reading, but those are all the goodies I have to share with you. Please like and subscribe and let me know which books you are looking forward to the most. It's March and April. There are so many of them and these are just the ones that I'm looking forward to the most. Obviously, there are plenty that I could not include on this list. So let me know if there are some that you think I should have included. I'm sure I missed plenty of great ones. That's it for me. I will let you get back to your book and I'll be getting back to mine. Thank you so much for joining me and I'll see you next time, guys. Bye.